जो सफर इख्तियार करते हैं वही मंजिलों को पार करते हैं अ वेरी फाइन एंड प्लेजेंट गुड इवनिंग टू वार एंड ऑल प्रेजेंट हेयर आई प्रोफेसर सारिका महाजन फ्रॉम जे बी आई एम एस ऑन बिहाफ ऑफ आई एम सी चैम्बर ऑफ कॉमर्स एंड इंडस्ट्री यूनिवर्सिटी ऑफ मुंबई जमना लाल बजाज इंस्टीट्यूट ऑफ मैनेजमेंट स्टडीज वेलकम यू ऑल टू द एट ऑरेशन अंडर द एज ऑफ आई एम सी प्रवीण चंद्र वी गांधी चेयर इन बैंकिंग एंड फाइनेंस A dream doesn't become reality through magic. It takes sweat, determination, and hard work. And this is such an exemplary event, which is an outcome of sheer determination. As for the years, we have added Nobel laureates like Muhammad Yunus, Mr. Finn Kidlin, and industry leaders like Mr. Uday Kotak, Mr. K. V. Kamath, Mrs. Arun Dutty Bhattacharya, Mr. Deepak Pare, and Mr. K. V. Rohanda, having graced this occasion for previous years. light is a symbol of blessings and prosperity as sunlight expels the darkness similarly blessing brings the happiness and prosperity in our lives so before we begin this event let's invoke the blessings of goddess saraswati and our elders so so now i request our chief guest mr aditya puri ji former managing director hdfc bank dr suhas pendikar honorable vice chancellor university of mumbai Mr Jujal Korakiwala President IMC Chamber of Commerce and Industry Mr Ram Gandhi Governor Pass President IMC Chamber of Commerce and Industry Mr Ajit Mangulkar Director General IMC Chamber of Commerce and Industry and Dr Shrinivas Nara Iyengar Director JBMS to please proceed for the lightning of lem I request the audience to please welcome our dignitary with a huge round of applause. I now request Mr. Jujal Karaki Wala, President IMC Chamber of Commerce and Industry, to present the bouquet of flowers to the Chief Guest, Mr. Aditya Puri ji. Thank you, sir. May I again request Mr. Karaki Wala to present bouquet of flowers to Dr. Suhas Pendikar, Honorable Vice Chancellor, University of Mumbai. We are the host now. You should be doing that. So let us take our the pleasure. Thank you, sir. I now request Mr. Karaki Wala, President, IMC Chamber of Commerce and Industry, to please give the welcome address. Good evening, everybody. Bombay University Chancellor, Vice Chancellor, Mr. Bednekar, Mr. Aditya Puri, members on the dais, distinguished friends, uh, members of the IMC who are here, and students who are here, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the IMC Chamber of Commerce and Industry, and my own. <coughs> I welcome Mr. Aditya Puri, former managing director of HDFC Bank, vice chancellor of Mumbai University, Dr. Suhas Pednekar, for sparing their valuable time and being with us this evening. A sincere thank is to Dr. Srinivas Iyengar, director, Jamnal Bajaj Institute of Management, and Dr. Durgesh Tinaykar, professor, IMC 
P.V. Gandhi Chair in Banking and Finance for organizing today's event. <clears throat> I'm pleased to inform you that this is the first major in-person event after two years. Today's address by Sri Aditya Puri has been organized under the auspices of the IMC Institute at Pravin Chandra Gandhi, Chair in Banking and Finance at Jamnalal Bajaj Institute of Management Studies. This is the eighth lecture under the chair since the chair was set up in 2011. The chair is a tribute to a visionary, Pravin Chandra V. Gandhi, who had many laurels to his credit. Laurels, yes, because of the extreme intelligence to understand the play between economics of business and finance and contribute to the society to make a, a visible difference. Whether he donned the chairmanship of Dena Bank, India's premier bank, or presiding over the manifold social, cultural, and educational institutions, Parveen Bhai, as he was fondly called, the manifold social, cultural, and educational institutions that he uh, led exerted powerful influence in shaping opinions cut across party lines to contribute to the country's growth path. Considering his phenomenal service and contribution in enriching various fields of public life, he was decorated by the President of India with Padma Bhushan in 2002. His long association of six decades with IMC Chamber of Commerce and Industry will always be revered and remembered. I thank Mr. Ram Gandhi for having taken this initiative of setting up the chair and to institute this chair uh, under the Pravin Chandra Gandhi for development of knowledge in banking and finance. Mr. Gandhi has been involved with the IMC Chamber of Commerce and Industry for the past 40 years. He is a director on many organizations and is a trustee of the Jamnabai group of newspapers as well as other public and private institutions. The PVG chair is the first of its kind to be set up by any chamber of commerce in India. It was established with the objective of promoting applied and empirical research on subjects which cater to the research needs of banking and finance sector with a view to gaining insights and broadening perceptions in these areas. The chair also takes up the task of training and developing highly qualified individuals for the field of banking and finance and organizing customized programs for the upgradation of skills and knowledge, levels of personnel working in the sector of banking and finance apart from seminars and conferences. As a natural corollary, the chair also provides consultancy services in the form of financial advice to enterprises engaged in this sector. I am confident that the chair will initiate young scholars into a thought process of growth, development and ideals which Pravin Bhai stood for. The current chair is headed by Dr. Durgesh Tinaikar, who has a rich experience in the banking sector. The topic of today, future of banking, could not have come at a more opportune time. With the augmentation of digital technologies, consumers have become more demanding of virtual experiences in today's time. The pandemic has only amplified the need for easy access to banking products, services, and information and surged the need for stress-free access to banking products and services. The future of banking will be driven by a major technological changes and will transform drastically. The future of banking, as Mr. Aditya Puri also often says, is in the air. It is digital. The COVID-19 pandemic has redesigned our lives in terms of how we shop, work, and even how we bank. And this has led to a major change in customer behavior. However, the digitization of the banking sector is not quite so sudden. Financial sector digitization began in the early 90s when automated ATMs and electronic fund transfers were introduced. Consequently, internet banking was permitted in India, followed by the National Electronic Fund Transfer, NEFT, and Immediate Payment System, RTGS, etc. Lately, India has been heavily relying on the UPI or Digital Wallet Payment System. Intending to digitize the economy, the government brought in demonetization in 2016, and then GST was introduced in 2017. With such bold initiatives, the government of India has voiced its intention loud and clear to make the banking and financial services truly digital. Furthermore, these steps 
have conceded incredible results. Transactions through debit and credit cards and UPI platforms have seen upsurge, especially over the last year due to the pandemic. Before I, before I end, I would like to quote a paragraph from a book which I have been currently reading called The Future is Faster Than You Think. It is written by Peter Diamandis and Stephen Kotler. I would encourage young students to certainly read this book. It says, I quote, <clears throat> exponential technologies are streamrolling banking and finance, completely altering this business of money. To understand what is coming, let's start with a simple question. What exactly do we do with our money? We store it, of course, mostly in banks. We also move it around, sometimes transferring cash between companies, other times borrowing or lending among individuals. Next, we invest it, trying to use our money to grow more money. Finally, since the time coins were conch shells, we trade it for the stuff we want. Thanks to converging exponentials, each of these areas is being reimagined with bits and bytes replacing dollars and cents. And neither economics nor the way we live our lives will ever be the same. I'm sure Mr. Rijapuri will dwell on this in his, in his talk this evening. I'm aware that you're all eagerly waiting to listen to our honored speaker. I do not wish to come between you and him, and I therefore now request Mr. Ram Gandhi to welcome Mr. Aditya Puri and offer a memento as a token of our gratitude for accepting our invitation and having come to this event despite his schedule. Thank you very much. I would now like to invite Dr. Suhas Bendigar, Honorable Vice Chancellor of University of Mumbai, to address the gathering. It's good evening, Mr. Aditya Puri, Chief Guest of today's oration and the main speaker. Mr. Khurakiwala, President IMC, Mr. Ram Gandhi, my colleague, Professor Srinivasan, Director of JBIMS, all the distinguished personalities sitting in the audience, ladies and gentlemen. It took almost two years to see you in three dimensions. And today we are so happy to have the eighth oration. And thanks to Mr. Ram Gandhi for taking initiative and getting associated with University of Mumbai to institute the chair. There are many speakers every year except maybe the last year. And today we all are, I would say, very delighted to welcome Mr. Aditya Puri here, a personality very well known in private sector. We know his contribution, something I don't have to tell you. And I'm sure you all are eager to listen to him. We all are living in what is called a disruptive era. Whatever is important today may not be so tomorrow. We don't know. And today's topic, the future of banking, on the background of, in fact, the strike by banks. And we are going to understand you know, how and why the people go on strike and how that bank's functioning and how is going to be the future of banking. We only know that the future is something we can't or don't await. It is something we create. 
As far as the University of Mumbai is concerned, I'll just take a couple of minutes. The COVID has given us a lot of opportunities. It all depends on us how we utilize these opportunities to bring the necessary changes. And whenever we talk about the nation building development of any country, it is always directly related to how that nation is excelling as far as the education is concerned. Because education is the only field which brings the necessary changes. And that is probably the reason why teaching is called the noble profession. Because it is the only profession, or it is, why is it called noble pro profession? Because it is the only profession which creates other professions. Just before coming here, I had a very nice talk with Mr. Aditya Puri and uh, his experience. And I just told him a couple of minutes back, now the time has come for all educational institutions which are expected to establish that equilibrium with the surrounding of the society around us to ensure that we involve all the stakeholders, everyone, all the experts from wider field to come together, discuss and what is it that we need to give to the next generation to prepare them for the future challenges. And there are going to be two important factors which are going to govern everything. And that is innovation and technology. Technology has to be used meaningfully. Even in education, though the COVID probably has accelerated the use of technology to some extent, which we were not prepared for, but still we are yet to achieve that level. And the University of Mumbai, which is a state university, and you can imagine the vastness, with nearly 850 colleges we have, 8.5 lakhs of students studying in university, with the geographical expanse of nearly 720 kilometers along the coastal line. There are huge challenges in terms of the heterogeneity. But we all have realized that the degree certificate alone is not going to help. We need to prepare them for all the future challenges and uh, we are going to have a, um, in fact, uh, good discussion with IMC. Even uh, I'm very happy to share with you that Mr. Aditya Puri has offered his services even to design some of the programs in, in, in finance to be offered to the undergrad and postgrad students to make them ready for the opportunities in the outside world. And that is exactly, I always tell my teacher colleagues that the time has come where you need to stretch your limits of possible, even going beyond it into impossible. And we need to prepare our students not for the, I mean, we need to prepare our students for the jobs which do not exist today. We need to have that foresight at what is going to be important after 5, 10, 15 years. And accordingly, we need to uh, prepare the students. Another objective where I'm very happy to share with uh, Mr. Aditya Puri and has agreed to help us is to make University of Mumbai completely digital. We have already started working towards it. It's a state university. I'm make use of this platform to make an appeal to all of those sitting here to extend your support to your alma mater. Many of you are definitely are the graduates of this institute. So the time has come to give back to your alma mater. We have several plans. We are going to have, in fact, several meetings later on. One of the priorities, as I said, is to make university digital in every respect and uh, two, to revive all the curriculum and to make it more relevant because what is missing today in the higher education system is what we teach in the classroom and what is required in the outside world. That is relevance and we need to work towards it and all, all of you need to come together to contribute and how we can make University of Mumbai as one of the leading universities not only in the, in the country but in, uh, in, the, in the globe. So, 
thank you very much for giving me this opportunity and um, we are very happy and eager to listen to uh, Mr. Aditya Puri and at the end like, what I can say that we need to be com considering the, the challenges we have to be restless all the time but that should be a positive restlessness. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir, for your wonderful words. It's an honor and privilege to have with us the chief guest of today's function. He returned to India in 1994 with a vision to build a world-class Indian bank. Leading the institution for 26 years since its inception, he grew HDFC Bank into the largest private sector bank in India and has created a culture of excellence in the bank. He retired in October 2020 as the longest serving chief of any commercial bank in the country. Customer focused in his approach, the man who is credited with using technology to transform the way banking is done in India, Mr. Aditya Puri, founding managing director of HDFC Bank. A commerce graduate from Punjab University and a qualified chartered accountant. Prior to HDFC, Mr. Puri worked with the City Bank for over two decades. He was serving as a CEO of City Bank's operation in Malaysia in 1994 when he was approached by Mr. Deepak Parik to set up a banking institution in India by putting into play his experience and global exposure in an attempt to revamp the banking system in a country. With trust, integrity, and transparency as overriding values, Mr. Puri, along with his team, built his consumer-centric technology-enabled institution. From hiring a people for the broken office in Sandoz House, as recollected by him in his last AGM, Mr. Puri has built the SGFC Bank into the massive corporation it is today. Mr. Puri believed in a financial inclusion, not just a financial excess. The bank launched Sustainable Livelihood Initiative in 2009 with an aim to deliver a financial support, including a training on occupational skills and financial literacy to that section of the population who lacks access to the formal banking services. Mr. Puri has been an instrumental part of the bank's digital transformation, launching the bank's Go Digital Bank Aap Ki Mutti Mein campaign in December 2014. And today, the concept of digital is ingrained in the DNA of the organization. Mr. Puri has received several awards and recognition during his tenure, including being named among the Barron's top 30 global CEOs from 2015 to 2018, Fortune top 20 business person globally in 2017, and being conferred the Lifetime Achievement Award by Euro Money Awards of Excellence 2020, amongst others. Mr. Aditya Puriji, it is an honor to host you today. We look forward to hearing from you and interacting with you during the course of this session. Ladies and gentlemen, for the highlight of the evening, now I would request Mr. Aditya Puriji to please share his thoughts on future of banking. Please welcome Mr. Aditya Puriji with a huge round of applause. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. I've been asked to speak on the future of banking. I'd like to extend this to, in a changing world, the future of commerce and in particular banking. The world was already changing and then COVID came along, turned it on its head and turbocharged the change. Now when you look at it, we are seeing changes in geopolitics and geoeconomics. There is a fundamental realization that globalization and democracy have failed. They've failed to address the problems of poverty, disparity, job creation. And you can see this reflected in the strident political discourse because there's a large number of people not happy with this. Clearly, the agreement that is coming around is we have to move towards a development that is sustainable and equitable and each one has to contribute and consequently you're seeing the emphasis on ESG as well as technology can really help us in making our growth more equitable and I'll come to that. 
China is challenging U.S. as a superpower. If that was not enough, now we have Russia drawing the limits of NATO expansion. This will change both geoeconomics and geopolitics. How, we all don't know at the moment, but it will become clearer as it goes along, and definitely the old models, both of business as well as global trade, as well as politics, will change. Climate change. I think a lot of us over our drink of scotch discussed climate change in the past. Mistake. Just one and a half percent warming has wreaked havoc. Whether it is tornadoes, whether it is forest fires, whether it's water rising, whether it's temperature rising, etc. But we've reached the limit. If we don't contain it at this level, I won't use the colloquial that my daughter would use, but we've had it. So this is no longer a drawing room discussion. This is a reality that everyone here should be concerned with. Because if we put on any more of our warming uh, and from here, we are in big trouble. But it's not easy because you have to get global consensus. It requires a hell of a lot of money. Then the advanced countries say, OK, we created the problem, but never mind. You bear it equally. But I think the realization is there. It requires tremendous amounts of money, tremendous conviction with every belly button that exists in the world. And let's hope we get there. Otherwise, we're not leaving a very nice world for our children, if we leave a world at all. The realization that governments cannot do everything is now coming across everywhere. You can see it in the change that is being demanded of the corporates. They have to move from shareholders. You don't only benefit Mr. Bajaj. You have to benefit everybody in this room <laughs> to stakeholder, and maybe outside the room as well. Neeraj, sorry. <laughs> so, so everybody has to contribute, each one of you. You can't just keep cursing the government. I get quite upset, but I get beaten up my, by, by my daughter. Ram's daughter is also sitting here. And when I say, you've got to do something, don't just talk. The way they spend money, they can do a lot better things with that money, Devna. You and your gang, too. The digital revolution caused by the secular shift in technology, telecommunication, social mobility, artificial intelligence, robotics is actually as was mentioned by some of the previous speakers, change the way we work, play, and live. A combination of these changes will require a complete transformation, and that's why I didn't want to restrict it only to banking, of society, government, and business. Then I think uh, some, uh, Mr. Korakiwala said people wanted to know about India, etc. So let me take two minutes to cover what, where India stands in this process. I'm a bull on India, so you, you have to temper my remarks accordingly. Fundamentally, I think this is the best time for India in a bad period. You know, like uh, the old, uh, who was it? Was it Wells or Wordsworth who said, it's the best of times, it's the worst of times. I think it's the best of times for us in the worst of times. Why? The digital infrastructure for public good UPI, Aadhaar, EKYC, and other elements of the stack, joined with what has been spent on infrastructure and the laying out of 5G and 4G transmission across the length and breadth of the country, really position, positions us to pole vault over the competition rather than just say, we leapfrog. Leapfrog is, you know, you, you just do this much. This, you're running away from someone. When you pole vault, you want to break the limits. And that is something that can be done. The interoperability provided by UPI, the amount of people on the net, the amount of people on the phone. But I do believe technology has to be democratized. It was sad to see when we had COVID, a lot of the people didn't have a smartphone, they couldn't even register. Why well, didn't trouble anybody? That's wrong because technology was supposed to benefit the people at the bottom of the pyramid more than at the top. So there are a couple of committees that we're working on where this should happen. The access device should be cheaper. It should be in more vernacular languages. It should make a difference to the people who are in far flung places, not just Bombay. Now when we take the infra spend, and I think I was discussing this with the VC also when we were there, we have forgotten that semi-urban and rural India still accounts 
for 50% of the GDP and 60% of the people live there. Now this place is ready for a transformation because now they've got water, they've got electricity, they've got roads, they've got connectivity. However, they don't have finance and it's very sad to see that most of the banks are only concentrating in the urban area and are saying we don't have uh, opportunity. I can speak for HDFC Bank. It can't be conflict of interest because I'm retired. So the fact of the matter is the reason it can grow faster is because it's gone to semi-urban and rural India. There's an aspiration there. There's disguised unemployment. They want to set up business. They want to buy consumer durables. If you want to reach your five trillion economy, this part of the country has to be galvanized. And it will. I think the Prime Minister I know is very convinced that this must come about and we will be helped because previously you couldn't lend to them because they did not have the requisite books and chartered accountants, etc. But now you have GST, you have income tax, you know his telephone bills, you know which car he is driving. I was talking with Neera just like what they do in Bajaj Finance. There are 120 points you can look across and come with a reasonably accurate uh, decision. In fact, he said he re read a book that uh, what was banking doing is actually true. I know more about you. Your wife may not know you. You have a girlfriend. I will. Because I know where you spent on your card. I know where you went. I know which card you drink. And that is the whole point of technology. I can recreate you. We think, I, I, I can't understand why we have not monetized our assets to the level because we need the money for education and health. Technology will help. The health mission will help. But we are in a position to take both education, technology and health into the length of the breadth of the country in a manner that is affordable. Now you come to the Ukraine war, it's not our war. Tomorrow, ek dusre ko. It's very sad, but for the first time we are not right in the middle of it. So will we be affected? Of course we will be affected. But will we, will we be less affected? Probably yes. Can we substitute China and everybody that's moved out of these countries? Yes. Can we get our demand from semi-urban and rural India? Yes. Do we have the capability to use technology to provide solutions? The answer is a yes. In addition, we have 8 lakh crores lying with the bank. Last time we used the 8 lakh crores, we didn't have to give as much of a stimulus as the rest of the world did, and they're paying for it with unimaginable inflation. 6% is nothing. We used that, we gave a guarantee, and the money came into the system, and that Again, that 8 lakh crores is collected. I, I, I wrote in the Economic Times that we should use this to galvanize semi-urban and rural India. And there's no point saying banks should do it, banks should do it. Oh, darta hai. Main darega, wo bad debt ho jayega, mere ko CVC marega. So let that be guaranteed initially by the banks and if we, uh, by the government. And if we can change that mindset, it can move forward. Now coming to the youth between banks and tech-based businesses which I think is a lump of crap. There is no bloody youth. And let me give you my idea exactly where it's going when we look at it practically. The purpose of the discourse was that I was giving till now, and I'll obviously, it depends on your time, I can talk for a long time, is that change is a must. Everybody will have to change. The world is changing. And competition is blurring. Abhi Amazon dukandar bank banna chata hai. He may be a sophisticated dukandar, but he is a dukandar, na? So why shouldn't I become a dukan? And we will. In fact, I, when I was at HDFC Bank, Smart Buy and our platform actually makes us the cheapest Apple phone you can get is from HDFC Bank. Because you buy, you get the Apple discount, you pay with a credit card, you get a further discount. So by definition, it becomes the cheapest. So what happens? A lot of the companies, nobody reinvented technology, whether you take Google, Amazon, Netflix, etc. They did not reinvent technology. They rode on existing systems, partly are the telecom companies and partly are the banks, to use technology to provide a more focused, convenient, frictionless service to the customer. So there's no reason why the bank can't do the same, because we know that business better. But the people that didn't change at all, they had a big problem. The, the guys, for instance, if you have, who are the guys that didn't make it? I, I know the guys who made it. Uh, but this actually border, 
uh, HMV, all these guys who thought they had the brand and they didn't need to change. Everybody needs to change because you need to reduce your cost, change your service levels. And there is a misconception promoted mainly by the technology guys that it's zero or nothing. No, even Amazon has an offline, online offering. So uh, banking will also be offline, online, and I'll come to what happens with the fintech. The question is, all these guys are very scared to become a bank. So my question is, uh, can and should other businesses, because all this Google Pay and tick, this Pay and bugger all Pay that you're riding on, is actually my product. What does Google Pay have to do? He's riding on my banking system and UBI. So my question is, should other businesses ride on the bank? And should they pay or should they pay for it? We can charge. But the politicians just now want to show that we are promoting digital so it's free. Everybody will run to get the customer. So if Amazon can become a bank, why can't I become my Amazon and a bank? By having a platform where I aggregate the various services. I'm not providing the service. I'm facilitating so that because you can then have and deal with us on a vertical basis. One place one stop rather than going from side to side to side. Amazon will never be a bank. Because if he becomes a bank, he comes under a fantastic regulation. And those who have been subjected to that, like Neeraj and me, I think are quite happy. If, if we could avoid it, we'd avoid it. Right, Neeraj? <laughs> so then what happens to the pricing? Cash back on my back. And has he actually built a customer base? Is it his customer? No. What he's been able to monetize till today is advertising. Has he done it anything else? Answer is no. When does he get subjected to the public good? Priority sector, all that lending which costs. So the issue ultimately, to put this in perspective as far as where banks are going and where fintechs are going, is the fight is going to be who owns the customer. Whoever owns the customer, the other fellow will become a service provider. If I let Amazon become my friend, then he talks to the customer and I provide the product. Can you hear me? Sorry, I was avoiding this. Okay, so the whole issue is who owns the customer? He must come to me, I will deal, and I will give him the full products. Both parties have their strengths, but in all this uh, hoopla, it's all getting lost. The banks have the brand, the trust, the money, the customers and a product range. What they don't have is the frictionless customer service at that low cost required, which they can, because these guys have gone to the cloud, etc. earlier, and geography and scale. The fintechs have scalable tech, they have frictionless service, low cost, but they don't have the customer, they have the customer, but no product. The only thing they have been able to monetize is advertising. So I can assure you, banks will be here for a long time. Uh, Mr. Koraki, while I was asking me, when will we have no banks? I said, when did the last time you go to Manhattan? Or you went to London? Go on Oxford Street or Manhattan, every fourth shop is a bloody bank. So if you're 10 years behind them, there's a long way before we go there. So the race is on. We have to see and where it will intersect. Most likely, in my opinion, is going to be more in terms of both fintech and banks collaborating together to provide a better service to the customer. Those days of rah, rah, rah and I'll come to that have gone. Banks need a complete transformation using the secular shift in technology, telecommunication, computing, etc. Purpose, speedy frictionless interface to improve customer experience better credit and risk management at scale, enable it, boundaries or geography. All, and there's so many things, so I said I'd better read it out. Also apply AI to massive amounts of data. We have the best data and information. Like I said, I can reconstruct you. And proper pricing. So banks have made progress. Lots of banks have made a lot of progress. And it a long time back, I think Nandan as a forward to one of the books on the bank said, I thought the banks were dead till I met HDFC Bank. And for him to say that, I would recommend, what's it called? Bank for the, no, the digital 2.0 or whatever, that second book, no? Yeah. Banks have moved a lot. UPI to provide payment services. 
we provide it and we provide it to Google as well. So even those payment services are actually provided by us. Use of chat box, commerce bots, humanoid robots for routine transactions. This is the first part of the uh, shift. Some banks have moved, and this is important, the internal system records to platforms. What the platforms enable you to do is that any application user could get access to a common set of capabilities through an API. API is an application processing interface. So they, they did the same thing. All these fellows, they sat on the telecom companies and in, eliminated their messaging business. They didn't set up telecom. Facebook just rides on their, their infrastructure. Some banks have moved to the end. So what does this enable us to do? This would allow quick launch of product across. When I say some, it's euphemism for HDFC Bank. This would also allow quick launch of products across urban and rural India because you can deliver at a cheaper cost through the use of technology as well as cheaper telecommunication. Loans in 10 seconds. We are the only bank that gives globally a loan in 10 seconds from the time you apply it to the time it's credited. No compromise on risk, nothing. You're just using, or, uh, uh, instead of having sequential processing, you're uh, based on the platform, everybody processes at the same time. You have the information and he applies also uh, digitally. So it's paperless, presenceless, cashless, using the bank's strength in underwriting, risk management, history with AI, reaching wider geography, low cost, improved product and customer service. You can also drastically reduce the time in the new business. I think banks who don't realize that lending to the large corporates, if they over lend, they get NPAs. The banks that have got a balanced balance sheet, that is wholesale and retail, don't, don't actually have a situation where they have to overlend to anybody. Use of marketplace platforms covering shopping, travel, auto, healthcare, etc., to provide a partnership. We are not going into that business. That is something that we're trying to explain to the regulators. We're just making sure that we act as an aggregator. He provides the service, it's written there that we are not doing it but we own the customer when he comes through us. And if he needs a loan, we will provide the loan. Amazon was one, you can do the same thing when you create an ecosystem, say for the automobile industry. Now, traditional pause, and that's what I was talking with the Vice Chancellor about. The traditional pause, replaced by digital pause, combining payments with new payment systems like UPI and QR codes, allowed banks to access new markets like schools, colleges, hospitals, and universities and we will be pleased to work with them. We have to move to cloud, because otherwise you, uh, the cost of computing goes up exponentially, and if your volumes, which UPI volumes are going up exponentially, if the volumes go up, and, you, and cloud is very different from the traditional system, then you will have a problem. Then the role of branches. Will branches be eliminated? For Christ's sake, no. How many of you don't go to a branch at all? Please raise your hand. Banks are also moving towards creating a digital bank within the bank because the regulations require you to have a specific license. Once they have gone through all this, you can deliver value propositions through consumer experience, which is intelligent, anticipating and automating tasks. And it's intelligent because it's using those 200 touch points to actually arrive at. We, we, we can work with Google and say when he comes in, somebody is coming for a search, what kind of search will translate into a need for financial services. Convenience of planning and executing vertically linked, that he comes to me, he can buy his grocery, he can buy his consumer durable, he can buy his medicines, he can buy everything, he can buy his travel, he can buy his hospitality, one shot in a safe manner and don't underestimate the safety aspect. We haven't even started with the frauds as yet. Once it comes in a big way, you'll see. So what we need ultimately is delivering superior experience that the customer expects requires seamless integration across diverse bank and non-bank systems. The way it works that if we can offer you another uh, customer's product is the system has to be integrated with us. 
the capacity to manage data sets from various sources to be able to get a better picture of the need of the customer rather than blanket bombing him. I had somebody trying to sell me panties, which is ridiculous. And that happened to be my own bank. But I said, now I, I, I sack you fellows. But, but this is long back. They've improved since. And you deploy analytics and credit across the length and breadth of the country, and you can provide. Now, if you look at the credit deposit ratio in semi-urban and rural India, it's 30%. It's not that the rest are not going or not borrowing. They're getting their pants taken off by the money lenders. It's our objective, and I want to work with as many people as I can to substitute a money lender. It's a must. Otherwise, you can't get those guys will not become consumption because he's spending all his time trying to repay the money lender who keeps adding charges. So what I, as we go forward, the main components for the bank is intelligent cloud because it provides scales, resilience, and quick delivery of products. Data management, centralized data management allows a single source of truth, better data access, controls, etc. APIs, welcome to the new bank. Okay, now we come to your fintech. Deadly fellows. Kaat, Paytm, deadly. Kya karta hai bhai, tattu? He makes payment, when will he make profit? What is his business model? Business model is I'm getting customers, but have you got the customer for what? You got a customer on cashback. Okay, he has not come to you for your brand. He has not come to you for the services you provide. He's come to get cashback. That is why they are having the problem. So Paytms, they need to figure out the Paytms and the like, how they will convert their customer base. If I try and sell my cross-selling a car loan to a customer, is a major problem. It's only 15%. We took it up to 22 from a bank. He's taken personal loan. He banks with us. His card is with us. Trying to sell him a car loan cheaper and more convenient than anybody else takes us ages. So that's not as easy as it seems. Oh, banks are dead. Bank, please don't write the obituary of the banks. In case you're not aware, it is the second oldest profession in the world. Huh? Then we come to merchant payments in POS. Here again, POS terminals and wherever they're working, in a combination with the banks to provide a better service, those models are working. Then you have digital lending. It's a disaster because they have not learned the creditors yet, and so their NPAs are 22%, and they will have to work out. I mean, it, it will work. I'm not just writing them off, but I'm saying don't make this fanfare so much and write off one side who's doing quite all right. Then you come to aggregators. So policy bazaar ka kya hua? Kyun share gir gaya? Fact to the matter is, let's get practical here. Yeah? You, you, what am I coming from? Beyond a point, I will choose. I will go. Now, people like Devna and my daughter Amrita, what they do is they'll, they'll check this much is here, this much is here, this much is here, this fellow is here, and then they go and buy. And if it's closed, then they want to feel also. So, yeah, it's it, not it, Wealth business is coming. Robo advisory is there, but the high net worth fellows, Nan also he doesn't want to, he wants a personal relationship manager. So in conclusion, I think I've taken too much of your time. Partly I took it because then I'll avoid the questions. But, but anyway, the conclusion is change is there. Customer is king, remember that. Neither technology, I was at an NASCAM conference and they said, what do you think we're doing wrong? I said, you're overestimating your importance. Technology is an enabler. It doesn't create businesses. The businesses it creates is by pro pro providing products to business. So when you hear this technology, fellows, you think single-handedly they will change it. And they always come up with thought processes like metaverse, that five to seven years before it becomes any kind of uh, reality. Whoever is the best person will win. There will be partnerships. There will be people who do it on their own. But largely, it will work on partnerships. In fact, today, digital plat platforms and partnerships account for 50 to 75% of the business being done jointly between fintech and banking 
across lending, liability, sources, uh, sourcing, and investment. So you will have also niche markets where people will go. So I think banks will survive, fintech will survive. I think there's no point getting all worried about fintech and technology. It's simple. First, you used to drive your car. Now you ride on the net. Then you ask the shopkeeper, now artificial intelligence tells you, you bought this movie, now would you like to see this? So that is all that metaverse is. Metaverse is replicating the real world digitally. And that's the same for Internet of Things. Who oh, refrigerator and so order car, they got yaar. I don't have to keep running to my wife, she can take vacation also. So that is where, so what I want to leave you with is that there is bright future ahead. There is change. The education systems have to change as well. And that's what I was discussing with the Vice Chancellor. Can we get where, <coughs> where we're talking about a BCom, can he also get a course on wealth management if he likes wealth management? Can he get a course in technology? Can he get a course on uh, FX management? Can he get a course on analytic based credit? And uh, opportunities are immense. So a lot of people who today feel kya hoega, merko kya job milega, ye thoda sa extra minat kar do. Today I know HDFC Bank wants to hire 10,000 people and we can't find anything beyond 2,000. So we are happy to work with you, but you will have to exert a little bit yourself. We will work with the chair, that's what we were discussing. The vice chancellor has been very, very open. He was thinking about the same thing. The country's future is bright. We have stable systems, we got bright Indians. Hindustan, what do you say? Jindabad, and that's it. Thank you so much for your time and patience. Thank you so much, sir, for the insightful lecture and for you sharing your rich experience with us. All these valuable insight will surely give us a new perspective on our future of banking. Our chief guest is now happy to clarify your doubts. So now we are open for a few questions. I request the audience to kindly give a brief introduction before asking the questions. Okay, before we take the questions, I request Mr. Ram Gandhiji, past governor, IMC Chamber of Commerce to address the gap. I want to address. I'm just recognizing the, the question. Yeah, Kundan Bhai. Please send the mic there, please. Hello. Yes. Sir, India loses 100 crores of rupees every day. Yes. Do you have any comment on the frauds in banking? 100 crores what? 100 crores are lost every day by banking frauds and the scams for last seven years. So you can answer this. Any comment on the frauds in the bank? How do you stop? Thank you. Ah. So firstly, there, there's a misconception that just because technology is there, there will be no frauds. Yeah. Chor always is smarter than you, wo chori to karega. So the only way out is that you create firewalls around your systems. There are hundreds of software available. So I think what you can do is you can bring the uh, frauds down substantially, but then there are frauds of two types. One is manufactured fraud, one is real fraud. Where the employee is also part of the fraud, that is not called fraud. So if he loan a loan, bad loan, which shouldn't have been given in the beginning, that is not a fraud. That is Bethi Ganga Me Aad Donam. But the actual frauds that are there can be fixed to some extent 
There's a lot of software available. You have to create ring fences around your systems. These, these uh, software then provide you with alerts. Then you have to see whether, you know, like if, for instance, somebody says, do you want to put a limit on? In fact, somebody was asking, this is the biggest question and worry why the movement to uh, mobile and net banking is slow because most people are very worried that my money went away and rightly so. But if you look at it partly, you can structure your uh, business with the bank in a manner. Second is the largest expense on technology for the banks going forward is going to be on fraud prevention. Good evening to everyone. Uh, I'm Pramod Shah, Practicing Company Secretary and a Corporate Consultant and former Chairman of STSI. Uh, there are two small observations I would like to, you to make, sir. One is, do you think this amalgamation concept, which has been recently introduced in the banking sector, will it help to survive the bank or will it uh, try to increase the productivity in the bank? And number two, sir, don't you think that the element of the corporate governance is lacking in the banking sector? And if that is there, then the fraud and other things could be stopped, sir. Your views on that, sir. Thank you. So amalgamation, if it's properly thought of and executed, should benefit. Normally, any amalgamation or acquisition is either to get incremental market share or reduce cost or get a new product base or you get a new geography. So uh, I'm enjoying my retired life currently, so I'll, what is actually the fact there, I'll pass. That you'll have to figure out. If they thought it out properly, and they execute it properly, then it'll come through well. Uh, your second question was that, what was the second question? I forgot. Uh, governor. A uh, governor said, what is the bank in this country? Yeah. So corporate governance, the king. Uh, corporate the governance, I'm saying corporate governance is bad only with the banks, is it? Corporate governance in this country is a problem. So, but the RBI is making very strong uh, actions and systems to improve corporate governance. Corporate governance, actually, there is, uh, you know, they put this halo around uh, corporate governance. Corporate governance is actually corporate culture, where you define what, what is your objective, what does the brand stand for, and then you have to put systems in place. The other day, one of the bureaucrats was there, and he said, what's happening? I said, look. The way the culture is there in HDFC Bank, I've never approved a loan. And if I tell somebody to approve and it's against the regulations, it won't be approved. And you've got to give the man on the ground the ability to hide behind the regulation and say this is not allowed. So corporate governance will come with the culture of the organization. It cannot come from talk at the board level. It cannot come at talk in the newspapers. It is a combination of the senior management walking the talk and establishing a culture which is based on that my brand stands for integ integrity, trust, and delivering frictionless, state-of-the-art technology, and everybody should walk that. Then corporate governance will come as a collateral. It's the same. You know, you, you do your business well, money will come as a collateral. But if you put that, paisa kaisa banaun pehle, to fir pata nahi kya kya hota hai. Please give it to the students. Uh, students. Sir, uh, uh, one minute. Uh, like, some students want to ask. Uh, I just. Uh, students ask, yeah, no, yeah, you yeah. fellows should be more concerned. Yeah. Hum to one please foot give in the back. The back. The lounge. Mein hai. Tum yeah. log yeah. Yeah. Kya please give it to the students. Yes, please. Go ahead. Hi. Uh, very good evening to you, sir. Thank you so much for this insightful discussion. I have three questions for you. First question was uh, with the advent of this technology uh, explosion, what could be the key drivers for technology adoption in the MSME sector, which is one of the biggest sectors today? And we see a huge difference in both the areas. There are companies like Amazon, which are absolutely high on technology analytics, whereas MSMEs are still in the la latently in the data curve growth. So what could be the key drivers for their adoption? That's question number one. Uh, you mentioned about the fact that customer is still the customer of the bank and these technology companies actually offer the frictionless services then. What according to you would have been the limiting factors for the banking industry then to actually not provide those frictionless services? Uh, and of course the last question would be this. Uh, we speak about the dark stores today. Do you see an envisage dark store is coming up for the distribution of personal financial services in the near future? Okay. The the first, first question, 
that uh, you wanted to know as far as the MSME is concerned. I think you'll be surprised at the pace at which the MSME is moving. He is coming on to platforms because he wants free distribution. He is changing his technology. He is integrating with the banks. He gets much better MIS. He is able to manage money. So I think that is a misconception. For, and because of that, even we have to work with them. So now when we started working, we are finding that they have a lot of information. So we worked, uh, HDFC Bank worked with McKinsey and now we can do uh, MSME loan in, our, in approve in our loan, four hours, three hours, based on technology available. So he also has the ability to actually figure out customer needs. For, for you know, even if you take a small fellow like Abanya, he knows that you have a order from your order he knows he order he needs to figure out as the customer walked with his feet so technology today is cheap technology is available both in terms of software you can get further access if you spread across the country because telecommunications is cheap and now access devices have also become much cheaper so definitely uh, that is something that will uh, move forward and will move forward well Sure. Have I answered your question? Any other thing you wanted? Uh, no, I, I was primarily looking at what could be the drivers to further increase the technology adoption then. As per the banking. If you don't hear the name of Mahmood, the biggest rupee will be able to do it, then he will do it, then he will not do it. Okay, last okay. question please. Okay, the next question no, about the limiting factors. One question please. Uh -huh. There are other people who would ask. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, sorry, it doesn't take more. Yeah, at the back. Students at the back. Hello. Uh, good evening. Thanks for your lovely discourse, sir, Mr. Aditya Puriji. Thank you. Uh, Vice Chancellor of uh, Mumbai University is here. He can give us the figure how many graduates are coming out every year. That is one thing. And you are talking of it's good digitization and complete technology in banking. So what will be the situation for employment, sir? Because there will be less and less number of employees requiring the banks. So that will affect the employment indirectly. Thank you. So I'll tell you, and you have a very enlightened vice chancellor. This is exactly what we were discussing over three. And it is occupying his mind even more. But I want to tell you that your assumption is wrong. If we change, the problem today is that employability of a BCom graduate, why would I hire him in the bank or hire, you know, or in any service? The days of the Babu have gone. He has to be retrained and you will be surprised to know there is shortage of people for the skills that are required. And that is what we are discussing with the university. We want to work with them to come up with the appropriate modules. We want to say if you pass, at least as many people as we hire, we will give preference. We want to see if we can introduce customer convenience through, through the use of a POS whereby one, the university knows exactly what is happening and what is needed and has data as to what type of fellow gets a job and is able to uh, analyze it, is able to manage the money better, the payments have been made. So I think there's a very comprehensive system that we've talked about. I have... Uh, despite the fact that I have better things to uh, do, but I think this is a good cause. Thank you. So no, I? No, no, no. I think the time is up, but you have one more question. No. Sir, I'm uh, Professor, uh, Professor C.A. Pradeep hmm? Kamtegar, uh, Finance and Accounts Officer of University of Mumbai. Sir, uh, these are the basic questions I think if they are addressed to, that will solve many issues of the middle class people across the country. So this is the question, these are the issues for the banking industry as such. The very first uh, issue is that, uh, sir, there are certain banks and they are giving OD facility against the salary. I think this needs to be started by the every bank. So that will take care of majority of the problems of the salary earners, point number one. I point number two, point number two. Ek -ek karke nahi toh bhool jata. <laughs> I think same as you, you got hope for the future. Second point is that, sir, there are issues, there should not be, but there are issues across the country where the pension papers are not getting cleared at the respective level and there's a delay in getting pension and we can imagine what must be the state of 
actually mind and the family. So in that case, if there is a product which comes out that on the basis of the pension papers which are sanctioned, only it is a matter of time, there should be OD facility against the pension. You can decide certain percentage, but that will give some amount to that family so that they will have bread and butter. I think it's a very good idea. Look at it. See, Sir, third point, third just, point. Just so that we can clarify for everybody that the fact of the matter is most of the points that you're saying are people are working on it, but you've got it fundamentally right. If the bank knows the salary is coming, his loan default rate is low. Similarly, there's no difference between salary and pension. The only difference you're taking, I, which I alluded to earlier, that lot of, don't give it to a fellow with two, two legs in the departure lounge. Eight leg or like other not, so that you've got some time to repay your loan. And this OD against pension is a secured loan because of the pension account will be with the bank and the areas of pension will also come with the same bank. Yeah. The point number three is that there are people who actually we wish that we should be in digital banking and people should use their credit card, etc. The interest charge for the delayed payment is as high as 3.95 and 4%. I think banking industry should do something on that and it should be reduced to the minimal because then that is having cascading effects. And then people who are not, see I operate my credit card on a monthly 100% payment basis, but then that if it could be done, it will help the so let me uh, people you, across the now, country. Now sir, that, one more. Sir, one wait, more. Yeah, wait. Now that, now that I'm not in a bank, I can be very honest with you. I give you all services free. So, I will take the money and go back. The rest of your service is free. My money is like this. So, don't do a late payment. If you do a late payment, the purpose is I should not be usurious. But at the same time, So, the last question. How many questions are you asking? Take a minute. See, these are the questions you could ask over a cup of tea. Okay. So, I think the students should ask questions. There are many students asking there. Please take the mic there. The students, students only. Start. Give your name and, and make it one question, please. No. Yeah. Hello, sir. My name is uh, Rahul Solanki. I wanted to ask you, with the advent of uh, Web 3.0, what is like a banking industry is looking at it as a challenge or as a threat or as a way to collaborate with it and serve the need of the people? Serve the need of the people through collaboration. And the banks that do that will succeed. If they try and do it on their own or ignore it, they will fail. Thank you, sir. See, okay. but the good part is for all of you who are sitting at the back there, I'm telling you, you pick up the skills that are needed along with your graduation, and we are going to be trying to help you. Just do one course. Now, you are better to say, say you want a job in wealth management in a bank or you want a job in the technology. Fundamentals of technology, you know, and this you can do by taking one extra course during your graduation or two and I can assure you you will get a job and from there you can do the job for a while and then take a job maybe do MBA or do a little more and you will be a rich man but heartbeat ke nahi fila ke nahi get chuchu karo thank you sir good evening sir good evening everybody my name is Sherlan first year JBIMS ke jara fast raklo your voice is soft Sorry, my name is Sherlan, first year JBIMS, F MFM. So my question to you is, in 1994, when private banks were starting operations, what were some of the drivers that led you to joining HDFC Bank, considering having a successful Citibank career ahead? Okay. Very wide question. Okay. No, I'll tell you. It's, it's actually a very good question that you asked, which will put a lot of things in perspective for the students as well. So what was happening at that time, now the transformation is very, very big at one time. But that time also there was a disruption in the sense that the public sector banks had the money, the distribution channel, the branches, but they didn't have the products to meet the customer needs. The foreign banks had the products and were charging disproportionately. I was a part of that. So we said when we were sitting there, I said, if I can collect a whole lot of dedicated people who will say that we will use this and bring a combination and create a large bank with products that are better than the foreign banks through the use of technology. And at that point of time, telecommunication had already come. The main, and you know, ultimately, 
uh, this damn chip is going to uh, fit into uh, your eye or your nail or whatever, that's the size it's going to be. So at that time, before that, they were mainframe computers, so they were costing hell of a lot, and IBM took you for a ride. That is the time they introduced smaller boxes, which is the way now cloud works, that you buy your capacity as you move along. Telecommunication had come, so you could provide anywhere, anytime banking. You could also eliminate the causes of geography by having your processing center where it's cheap and not expensive. So we wanted to use all the disruption at that stage. And frankly, we have every three to four years, we've changed the bank completely. We are going through a major transformation now. Uh, and that's what came in. And because we did that, and to answer the other gentleman's question, ultimately you have to, and when I said technology is not a solution, Technology is a solution to a problem that a business has, which will give a better service to the customer. And if you give better service, you will succeed. And Amazon succeeded on the same basis. He des describes the customer. You sent me that message, no, Suman? He, he describes the customer fundamentally as a very difficult, very demanding, but necessary evil. OK, two questions left now, only two questions. Please give to the lady there. Hello. Hi. Good evening, sir. Uh, my name is Harsh. I'm from JBIMS FMS Patch. A uh, very simple, straightforward question. I wanted to understand your view on cryptocurrencies and how in the future, because as you said in your talk also, that change is the only constant. Uh, how are banks going to get interlinked with cryptocurrencies, if at all? And uh, secondly, uh, India is usually a bit backward in terms of ad adopting new technology. Do you think that India should uh, put the a medal on the pedal and start accelerating in the direction of cryptocurrencies. See, you can't force the acceleration. Firstly, let's get on crypto. I think before we go on to cryptocurrencies, the blockchain will find more uses than the currency has. Can you help me? So the currency has implications, all kinds of implications, money laundering, this, that, etc. Ultimately, it will come and they, the RBI is trying to make a foray. But if you see what is happening with the uh, metaverse, the blockchain technology will be the precursor of the cryptocurrency, which will ultimately come. And I think now I'm not sure that we are behind the technology because the number of startups that come to me asking me to invest in the startup is phenomenal and it is only going to multiply. So technology change is good that if the customer demands it, now for instance COVID, yes COVID was the cause, but the change came because the customer wanted delivery like that. So when the customer demands it, when he feels the need for it, you will have to change because you, now you no longer have that uh, lead time that I have to first set up the factory is that I can set up a global bank in one week Because the systems are available. I go on cloud. I can do the product and push it through So the customer what he demands and what he accepts will work and There's certain things he wants to do online like I'm now chairman of farm easy even though we tell them for a damn common code, why are you spending so much on a taxi in the middle of a traffic jam? I'll put you online with the best doctor. Tum teleconsultation karo na. Nahi karega. Time lagega. So you can't force technology adoption. It has to come with a demand. Once there is demand, people who want to be in business will have to adjust and use the available infrastructure to meet that need. Okay, the lady will have the last Thank question. You. Who raised her hand? Please give the mic, please. Hi, uh, hi this is Meghna from JVMS doing MIM course there, first year. Uh, so, my question is uh, first and foremost, I would like to praise HDFC. I've been a customer since more than 20 years. Super service, so thank you for that. I'm sure it's top round. You're a very good girl. I'll take a long time answering your question. <laughs> <laughs> and my question is uh, regarding digital payments. Uh, what my understanding is, the government promotes digital payments. But when we actually go to purchase to localites, there are many shops, many vendors who do not, or they say you pay an extra charge, 
or we will not take a digital payment, not accept a credit card, because we have to pay a charge. So what it takes for a bank to do away with that extra charge or whatever it is, we so that digital payments can get promoted further. No problem. We must educate the customer. Why doesn't he pay through UPI or QR code? You pay with the card, <laughs> the merchant has to pay an MDR. Right. You know all that. You're smiling. You know he can pay through. You are testing my knowledge or what? No, no, no. <laughs> so <laughs> the ask is if you if the banks can have something card mein to well, charge lage haan, card pe charge nikal do so that card mein charge they can let me explain it. to you why also we have to put a telecom line we have to put the post terminal we have to put software at the back we have to put hardware if we don't do all that we can't offer cards the hardware and software and the ecosystem for upi qr code is provided by upi and that is one of the best globally so it's best if the smaller payments you make, like when you buy all your stuff, you pay through UPI only. No, tell the truth. Uh, I'm not a, I would not prefer. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So with that last question, we now conclude our Q&A session. Now I would request Dr. <laughs> Srinivas and Ayangar, Director, Jamnalal Bajaj Institute of Management Study, to kindly propose a word of thanks. Yeah. Good evening. At the outset, it's my pleasure and privilege and honor to offer a vote of thanks on behalf of Jamnalal Bajaj. I thank Honorable Vice Chancellor for his kind and extended support we always do with our Jamnalal Bajaj. Thank you, sir. We already had earlier session, we had a versatile speaker. Every ex speaker used to bring their versatility and uniqueness in the topic. Thanks to Aditya Puri, sir. Today, this entire hall flooded with the knowledge of future of banking. I was just in a, taking a couple of points. Trust me, it has gone more than three pages. Then I said, okay, I don't want to give another lecture. I kept the paper there. Because he focused about customer centric, technology adaptation, artificial intelligence, blockchain, reinventing business model. And also, I'm wondering that he talk about resilience as well as agility. Almost, he covered almost all the points in a simple, lucid language. I really appreciate, sir, in the, it's, it's a good learning for us. The tremendous put effort has come from Indian merchant chambers for the past couple of weeks. So, I would like to thank uh, Korakewala, sir. Just he left, he had another meeting to chair the session and Ram Gandhi sir and uh, Ajit Mangurkar for the entire team and our own faculty members, invited faculty members, Chair Professor Tinekar and Sarika Mahajan and beloved our students. We really appreciate each and every students who invested your quality time with us in this today evening. In return, I am, we are sure to offer such program in near future. I really welcome all and thanks a lot for the wonderful support and be stay safe and thank you. Jai Hind. So once again, I would like to extend my gratitude towards all our dignity for sparing their valuable time and making this event huge success. Let me conclude this event by sharing a beautiful thought. It is during our darkest moment that we must focus to see a light. Thank you all. Stay safe. Stay happy. Oh, no. yeah. The hall we have.